How's it going, everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the most rare and valuable coins in Canada. Today, we're going to be taking a look at 10 surprisingly valuable Canadian coins that could be hiding in your pocket change, and if identified correctly, could make you some big money. Every single one of the coins that we discussed today, although extremely rare, is not impossible to find. And in this video, we will explore each of these valuable pieces of currency and delve into why they hold such incredible value in Canadian numismatics. Additionally, we will discuss any distinguishing and identifying features, their significance among collectors, and also the potential value if you happen to find or own a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can follow along with my new content as it is being released. And then without any further ado, what do you say we take a look at 10 surprisingly valuable Canadian coins that could be hiding in your pocket change? Let's get it, guys. So before we do get into the value and specifications for the 1991 quarter, I thought I would go over some of the story of how a coin with such a limited mintage can actually come into existence. Coin mintage refers to the quantity of a specific coin design produced by a mint during a particular year or time period. It is a fundamental aspect of a coin's history and production. The rarity of coins is usually measured on how scarce or uncommon they are in relativity to its total mintage. Coins with lower mintages are generally considered more rare because there are fewer of them available to collectors or the public. Several factors contribute to the rarity of a coin, including mintage numbers. Coins with low mintage numbers are inherently rare. When fewer coins are minted, there are fewer available to collectors to acquire. Survival rate. The number of coins that have survived over time also affects rarity. Coins that were well preserved or saved by collectors are more likely to be available today. Melting and withdrawal. Changes in composition or economic factors like the alloy recycling program can lead to the withdrawal and melting of coins. This reduces the number of surviving specimens and increases the rarity of some dates. Coins that have garnered significant collector interest tend to be less common in the market due to collectors acquiring and holding on to them. Rarity is a critical factor in determining the value of a coin. Generally, rare coins command higher prices in the numismatic market. Collectors and investors are often willing to pay a premium for coins that are difficult to obtain due to their limited availability. The condition or grade of a rare coin can also significantly impact its value. Coins in excellent condition are more desirable to collectors and can fetch higher prices. Usually coins with low mintage figures will also hold some historical significance. They may mark a special period, event, or a change in coinage history. This historical context adds to their appeal and value. Numismatists value coin that provide insights into the past and low mintage coins often do just that. Collector preferences can drive demand for specific coins. Coins that are part of a series or set have unique designs or represent specific milestones and are highly sought after. Collector demand can create competition and influence prices, particularly for rare and desirable coins. Market trends including auction results and changing collector tastes can impact the value of coins. Prices for some key dates may fluctuate based on market dynamics and also demand from buyers. Another major factor that could have led to the creation of the Canadian 1991 quarter is labor disputes and strikes. Labor disputes, strikes, or work stoppages at a mint can disrupt normal coin production operations. Mint employees, including coin press operators, engravers, and other key personnel may participate in strikes to demand better working conditions, higher wages, or other labor-related issues. Strikes often lead to production delays as mint facilities may operate at reduced capacity or cease production altogether during the strike period. This can result in a backlog of coins that need to be minted once the strike is resolved. A strike can directly impact the mintage numbers for a given year or denomination. If the work strike occurs during the planned production window for a particular coin, the mint might not actually be able to produce as many coins were as originally intended. This can lead to a lower mintage for the affected coin. 
Strikes may also affect the quality of coins produced during and immediately following the strike period. Mint employees returning to work after a strike may need some time to ensure that the coin presses and equipment are operating smoothly, potentially impacting the quality of the struck coins. In the case of the 1991 Canadian quarter, if there was indeed a strike at the Canadian Mint during that year, it could have contributed to the lower mintage of quarters for that specific date. The disruption in production and potential quality control issues may have led to a scarcity of well-struck uncirculated specimens further enhancing the coin's rarity and desirability. Now, some of the reasons that the 1991 Canadian quarters are considered so rare compared to their counterparts in the similar date ranges. In 1991, the Canadian Mint produced a significantly lower number of these quarters compared to other years. This limited mintage is a key factor in the coin's rarity. The exact reasons for this low mintage are not always publicly disclosed by Mint, but there are a few potential explanations. Economic factors. Economic conditions can influence a mint's decision to reduce coin production. In times of economic uncertainty or budget constraints, mints may reduce the production of certain denominations, including quarters, to save on costs. So, foreseeing the production of the 1992 Provincial Series, they may have actually reduced the size of the production run for 1991 quarters. I don't think they intended to reduce it that small, but that would definitely be a good reason right there. Supply and Demand if there was a surplus of quarters from previous years in circulation and a reduced demand for new quarters, the Mint may have decided to produce fewer coins to avoid an oversupply. While the reverse design of the 1991 quarter was not unique or commemorative, it's possible that the Canadian Mint still opted for a lower mintage that year based on their production plans and priorities. Over time, the low mintage of the 1991 quarter gained the attention of coin collectors and numismatists worldwide. The combination of a low mintage figure and the regular design led to increased demand among collectors, further driving up its rarity and value in the secondary market. Many of the 1991 quarters that were minted entered circulation where they endured wear and tear. As a result, finding well-preserved uncirculated specimens from that year became increasingly challenging, contributing to their rarity. So what do you say we go over some of the specifications and give you guys the potential values if you did ever discover one of these in your pocket change or coin roll hunting. So the Canadian 1991 quarter has a mintage figure of 459,000. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Dorda Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse and Emmanuel Han for the reverse. The edge is rated, it is magnetic and it comes in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now one of the greatest things about this 1991 quarter is that it is a coin that retains a premium even on the low end. If you find one of these and it's all beat up and been put through the meat grinder and it's at the very bottom of the Sheldon grading scale, you can still get some decent money for it around five to ten dollars which is a decent profit considering that you only invested 25 cents to find the coin. But when you start to get into the MS region, you start to see some pretty big price jumps. It can be worth around $10 for an MS60, around $20 for an MS64, and all the way up to $120 for an MS66. And this is a coin that's value is only gonna go up over time. It doesn't just have one of the lowest mintage figures of any Canadian coin in the last 50 years, but any coin produced in North America, probably within the last 150 years. This is an incredibly rare coin, but it is one that is fairly modern and they are still floating out there. I've known several Canadian coin roll hunters that have found even a few of these in their coin roll hunts, and I know that you can find them in your pocket change too. So it is definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for. And I only see the value going up on these bad boys as time goes on. The Canadian 2002 Toonies, featuring the unique date inscription of 1952 to 2002, hold a special significance in the realm of Canadian numismatics. These coins were released to commemorate Queen Elizabeth II's Golden Jubilee, and these coins symbolize a milestone in Canadian coinage history. The obverse side of the toonie depicts the effigy of Queen Elizabeth II, while the reverse side features the iconic image of the polar bear. The introduction of the bimetallic toonie in 1996 revolutionized the country's currency, providing enhanced durability and security features. The $2 coin, with its distinctive outer ring and inner core, 
quickly gained popularity among Canadians and collectors alike. The 2002 Toonies are part of a broader series of Canadian coins minted that year, each carrying its own significance and design elements. From the double-dated penny all the way to the uniquely designed commemorative 50-cent pieces, these Canadian 2002 coins reflect the country's rich cultural heritage and diverse landscapes. One interesting fact about the Canadian Toonie is its nickname, which derives from a combination of two and loony. The term loony refers to the $1 coin featuring a common loon design on its reverse side. When the bimetallic $2 coin was introduced, Canadians naturally dubbed it the Toonie, emphasizing its double denomination. This unique naming tradition adds a touch of whimsy to the Canadian coinage system, further enhancing its charm and appeal to collectors worldwide. The dot in H variety for the 2002 Toonie is a fascinating air that adds a layer of intrigue to this already collectible coin. This air manifests as a small dot, likely a die chip, situated in the bottom half of the letter H in the word Elizabeth, on the obverse side of the coin. Located beneath the center line of the H and nestled between the two side lines that form the letter, the dot in H air is a subtle yet distinctive characteristic that sets certain specimens apart from the standard circulation coins. Identifying the dot in H variety requires a keen eye for detail. Numismatists and collectors often scrutinize the lettering on the obverse of the coin, paying particular attention to the word Elizabeth. Upon close inspection, the presence of a small dot between the center line of the H should be apparent. While some variations in the strike or surface imperfections may resemble this air, the distinct placement and size of the dot help distinguish genuine dot and H varieties from other mint anomalies. The origin of the dot and H air can most likely be attributed to the coin die used in the minting process. Die chips, which are small pieces of metal that break away from the surface of the die, can inadvertently transfer onto the coins during striking. In the case of the dot and H variety, a tiny chip likely formed on the die used to stamp the lettering onto the coin, resulting in the formation of this distinctive dot. Factors such as wear and tear on the die, improper maintenance, or defects in the manufacturing process could contribute to the development of die chips and consequently errors like the dot and H 2002 Toonie. Despite its relatively subtle nature, the dot and H air holds significant appeal among collectors due to its rarity and uniqueness. Coins exhibiting this variety command attention and often fetch much higher prices in the numismatic market. The quest to acquire such elusive specimens drives collectors to carefully examine their coins and search for these distinctive airs. As a result, this 2002 dot and H variety adds an element of excitement and discovery into the world of Canadian coin roll hunting, especially when it comes to Toonies, and highlights the intriguing intersection of artistry, craftsmanship, and the chance of anomalies occurring during the minting process. Now before we get into the values for the 2002 Toonies, first let's go over some of the specifications. If any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not a legitimate example. I'm not too sure about the 2002 Toonies, but I know that there are 1996 counterfeit Toonies. There are also 2000 knowledge counterfeits, and 2005 and 2006 are very common years for counterfeit Toonies. Now the counterfeiters would have had to make a separate obverse die for this 2002 Toonie because it does have the double date of 1952 to 2002. But in the case of the 2000 Knowledge Toonie, there are counterfeit examples of that coin. So it didn't stop them having to make a different reverse design. So very well, there could be some counterfeit examples of these 2002 Toonies floating around. And if you happen to find one of those, it doesn't matter if it has die chips or not, it is pretty much worthless. So the overall mintage figure for the 2002 Toonie is 27 million and 8,000. The coin is composed of an outer ring of 100% nickel and an inner core of 92% copper, 6% aluminum and 2% nickel. It has a weight of 7.3 grams, a diameter of 28 millimeters and a thickness of 1.8 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Dora DePatry Hunt and Ago Arand for the obverse and Brent Townsend and Ago Arand for the reverse. The edge of the coin is serrated and it has a die axis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British and Australian coins. Now, as I've mentioned in several of my other videos, unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of Canadian loonies and toonies that are worth too much above their face value. 
And usually if you find any of the Canadian one or $2 coins and they're pretty beat up and not in the greatest shape, you are not going to be able to get a whole lot more money for them than they are actually worth. Now, in the case of the 2002 commemorative toonie, the most amount of money that you could get for that coin is $72 for an MS-66. Now, that is for the regular 2002 double-dated toonie without any errors or varieties. Now, if you can identify the dot, which means you have to flip over to the obverse and look for a small dot or die chip located in the center bottom of the H in Elizabeth, then it can add a pretty large premium to the coin and makes it about twice to three times as valuable as the regular issue. So it can be worth around $20 to $25 for an MS-64 example, around $120 for an MS-66, and if you were able to find one and it got the MS-67 or higher, you could easily be talking a $500 to $1,000 toonie. This is a fairly modern piece, so if you are coin roll hunting toonies or checking your pocket change, there is a good chance that you might be able to find one of these 2002 toonies, and it is still in pretty decent shape. But if you want to be able to get the most amount of money for a 2002 dot and H toonie, you want it to be in an exceptional grade, and the best chance of finding one of the toonies that scores in the high MS range is going to be out of an uncirculated roll. Now, being released in the year 2002, these coins are now 22 years old as I am making this video, but in the world of coin collecting, that is a mere blink of an eye, and you can actually find these rolls on Canadian coin sites like Coins Unlimited and Colonial Acres for a pretty decent price. And if you happen to buy one of the rolls, bust it open and can identify one of these die chips, which is definitely possible. A lot of the time when you are looking for errors or varieties like the 1964 extra waterline nickel, usually if you are busting open an uncirculated roll, either all of the coins will have the error or variety or none of them will. But when it comes to a more minor error or variety, like the dot in H, which is a die chip, there is a chance that a few of these toonies could have made their way into the roll, and if you can identify the die chip for the dot in H variety, and even a few of the toonies have them and they are in really good shape, you can turn a massive profit. Die chip errors such as the pedestal D, pedestal S, and pedestal zero varieties can be found on the 2000 Canadian toonies and are intriguing anomalies that captivate both numismatists and collectors alike. Understanding the nuances of each of these varieties requires a keen eye for detail and also an appreciation for the intricacies of the minting process. So what I will do is I will go through each of the three different pedestal varieties that can be found on the 2000 Knowledge Toonies and I will tell you how to identify them and then we will discuss the values of all of these rare coins. So let's start off with the pedestal D variety. This variant is distinguished by a minute die chip located on the bottom left of the letter D in the word dollars on the obverse side of the coin. To identify this anomaly, one must carefully inspect the lettering, particularly in the word dollars. The die chip you are looking for should appear as a small protrusion or imperfection, often barely noticeable to the untrained eye. The die chip in the pedestal D variety can be located to the bottom left of the D in the word dollars. Moving on to the pedestal S variety. To identify this, you have to direct your gaze towards the bottom center of the letter S in the word dollars on the obverse side of the coin. If you can identify a small die chip at the bottom center of the letter S in dollars, then you have the pedestal S variety. Identifying these anomalies requires meticulous scrutiny of the coin's surface with a focus on pinpointing any deviations or irregularities in the lettering. And then last but not least, we have the pedestal zero variety, which presents a unique die chip error on the reverse side of the coin. So to locate this anomaly, you need to flip over to the reverse and then look at the last digit of zero in the date of 2000 that is engraved on the coin. If you can find a tiny die chip at the bottom right of the digit zero, it will set it apart from the standard issue toonies and you will have the pedestal zero variety. Now, how exactly do these rare die chip errors come into existence? The creation of die chip errors is a result of various factors inherent in the minting process. During the production of coin dies, which are used to stamp designs onto blank planchettes, imperfections can occur due to wear and tear, improper maintenance, or even minute particles becoming lodged within the coin dies. These imperfections manifest as tiny protrusions or irregularities on the surface of the die, which in turn transfer onto the coins during the striking process. 
The result is a series of coins featuring these subtle yet distinguishable anomalies, such as the Pedestal D, Pedestal S, and Pedestal Zero varieties found on the 2000 Knowledge Canadian Toonies. In the realm of numismatics, these die chip errors add a level of intrigue and complexity to coin collecting. They serve as tangible reminders of the meticulous craftsmanship and inherent variability that is present in the minting process. As enthusiasts continue to seek out these fascinating anomalies, they contribute to the rich tapestry of numismatic history, preserving and celebrating the quirks and intricacies of coinage for generations to come. Now, some of the details and specifications for the Canadian 2000 knowledge tunies, if any of these are off and may indicate that the coin is not authentic, Canada actually has a huge problem with counterfeit tunies. It is not too often that you will find general circulation coins that are counterfeited because usually it will not be profitable. But in the case of the Toonies, it is actually profitable for them to make counterfeits simply because the material that is used is cheaper than the actual face value of the coin. The dates you will usually find for Canadian counterfeit Toonies are 1996, 2000 Knowledge Toonies, and also 2005 and 2006. So you definitely want to make sure all of the specifications are bang on if you want to identify any of the pedestal varieties and be able to get the maximum amount of money out of this coin. Because if you identify these on a counterfeit, it will be pretty much worthless. So the coin is composed of 100% nickel for the outer ring and the inner core is composed of 92% copper, 6% aluminum and 2% nickel. It has a weight of 7.3 grams. It has a diameter of 28.00 millimeters for the exterior and 16.8 millimeters for the center with a thickness of 1.80 millimeters. It was designed and engraved by Dora DePadre Hunt for the obverse and Cosme Safiotti for the reverse. The edge is interrupted serration and the die axis is in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British and Australian coins. Now let's get into the value for the different pedestal varieties for these 2000 knowledge tunies. First, we'll start off with the 2000 knowledge tunie without any errors or varieties. It can be worth around $2.90 for an MS60 and all the way up to around $150 for an MS67. Now, if you can identify the pedestal D variety, which will mean there will be a small die chip located to the bottom left on the D in the wording for dollars on the obverse of the coin, it can be worth around $5 for an MS63 and all the way up to $350 for an MS66. So the pedestal D variety is about twice as valuable as the regular 2000 knowledge tuning without any errors or varieties. And then we have the 2000 knowledge pedestal S variety. You can identify this by locating the die chip on the center bottom of the S in the wording for dollars. It can be worth around $5.20 for an MS63 and around $300 for an MS66. It's actually a little bit less valuable and rare than the pedestal D variety, but still worth a lot more than the regular issue without any errors attributed. Now, I wasn't actually able to find any of the Pedestal Zero variety price listings online, but if I had to give an estimate, I would say that it is probably similar in price to the other two, probably worth around $300 for an MS66, and it can probably be worth around $5 to $10, all of these for an MS63 example. When it comes to their low end value, it's pretty much a case of whatever you can get someone to pay for it is what you will get. If the die chip for any of these pedestal varieties is very noticeable, then it may add a slight premium to the coin. Also, if you can compound any of these varieties together, for instance, if it has the pedestal D and the pedestal S variety at the same time, then you will probably also see some price jumps. It could easily double the value of this coin. If you're able to get the pedestal D and S variety both attributed to it, I couldn't doubt that you could get easily around $1,000 for it if it is a high grade example around an MS66 or MS67. So these are some good varieties to look for. None of the Canadian tunies, unfortunately, are worth a whole lot on the low end. If you can identify any of these errors or varieties for these pedestal Canadian tunies, it's pretty much a matter of they are worth whatever you can get somebody to pay for them. The Canadian $1 coin, affectionately referred to as the Looney, is a gold-colored coin issued by the Canadian Mint in Winnipeg since its debut in the year 1987. Its reverse side features the design of a common loon, a bird widespread in Canada. 
Queen Elizabeth II graces the obverse of the coin until recently when King Charles III is about to make his debut. Now the coin has seen various commemorative additions with unique designs replacing the loon image. With its distinctive 11-sided polygonal shape and unique dimensions, the Canadian loonie bears a resemblance to the Susan B. Anthony dollar in the United States. The coin's shade matches the gold color of the Sacagawea and presidential dollars. After its introduction, the term loonie became synonymous with the Canadian dollar. In common Canadian language, it's often discussed in media regarding its exchange rate. The Canadian Mint actually acquired the trademark for the term loony in the year 2006. When the Canadian $2 coin was introduced in the year 1996, it quickly earned the moniker of Toonie, a blend of two and loony. In March of 1986, the Canadian government announced the phasing out of the dollar bill in favour of the new dollar coin to be introduced the following year. The initial production of 300 million coins, costing $31.8 million, aimed to generate annual revenue exceeding the production costs. Funds from the coin, including $60 million, for the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary were expected to benefit various projects. The decision to model the coin after the Susan B. Anthony dollar aimed to ensure compatibility with US vending machines, as it shared a similar size and color. The perceived failure of the Susan B. Anthony dollar in the United States, which was attributed to its unattractiveness and resemblance to the quarter coin, actually influenced the design and marketing approach for the new dollar coins. Now, before we discuss this loony variety, first we should go over the gentleman who is actually featured on this coin. He's a Canadian whose story is not only inspirational, but has made him one of the most beloved and cherished icons in Canadian history, and that man is Terry Fox. Terry Fox was born on July 28, 1958 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. In the year 1977, at the age of 18, he was tragically diagnosed with bone cancer in his right leg. To prevent the cancer from spreading, Terry's right leg was amputated 6 inches above the knee and he received a prosthetic limb. While undergoing treatment, Terry was deeply moved by the suffering of cancer patients around him. He then conceived the idea of the Marathon of Hope, a cross-country run to raise awareness and funds for cancer research. Terry believed that if each Canadian donated $1, it could make a significant impact. On April 12, 1980, Terry Fox dipped his artificial leg in the Atlantic Ocean in St. John's, Newfoundland, marking the start of his cross-country run. Despite challenges and skepticism, Terry remained determined to run across Canada to the Pacific Ocean. His journey covered an average of 42 kilometers or 26 miles per day, the equivalent of a marathon. His journey took him through six provinces and he faced physical challenges including blisters, extreme weather and exhaustion. Along the way, Terry became a national hero, capturing the hearts of Canadians. After running for 143 days and covering 5,373 kilometers, that's 3,339 miles, Terry Fox was forced to stop near Thunder Bay, Ontario on September 1st, 1980. Unfortunately, the cancer had returned and spread to his lungs, making it impossible for him to continue. Terry Fox's Marathon of Hope raised over $24 million for cancer research. He became a symbol of hope, courage, and the power of one individual to make a difference. Terry Fox passed away on June 28, 1981 at the age of 22, but his legacy lives on through the annual Terry Fox Run and the ongoing work of the Terry Fox Foundation. Terry Fox's story continues to inspire people globally and his impact on cancer research and awareness remains immeasurable. Now what do you say we get into the coin that you guys are all here to find out about and that is the 2005 Terry Fox No Grass Variety. In the year 2005, the Canadian Mint decided to immortalize Terry Fox by featuring a depiction of his incredible marathon on the reverse of some of the loonies released for circulation that year. Little known to most, there are actually two recognized varieties for this loonie which gravitate around the presence or density of what should be a patch of grass behind Terry Fox. The more rare of these two varieties is the no grass, which to identify you want to look at the grass in the background behind Terry Fox's ankle. Now there will still be some grass present in the no grass variety, 
but it should be more spread out and not quite as dense as the regular grass variety. Now I will put an example of what the no grass variety looks like on the screen right now, but what I suggest is if you find a 2005 Terry Fox Looney that you hold onto it regardless if it is the grass or no grass variety, and you actually use it to compare or as a reference if you do find any more, and you can probably determine a lot more easily whether you have the grass or no grass variety. Now some of the details and specifications for this coin, the 2005 Terry Fox Looney has an overall mintage of 12,909,000. It is composed of 91.5% nickel and 8.5% bronze. It has a weight of 7 grams, a diameter of 26.50 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.75 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Susanna Blunt and Susan Taylor for the obverse and Robert R. Carmichael and Terrence Smith for the reverse. The edge is smooth, it is magnetic and has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, Australian and British coins. Now unfortunately, as is the case with most Canadian loony and toonies, it is very hard to find any that are worth much more than face value, especially when they are pretty beat up. But even though these coins are not worth a fortune today, they do have the potential to increase in value over time as they have already seen some pretty big price jumps and only being a few decades old means that if you do find one, it will usually be in pretty good shape. Charlton Catalogs currently evaluates this coin at $150 for an MS66 example but Coins in Canada gives it a much lower value. Now, MS66 is a very high grade, but it is not the top of the Sheldon scale. It is not quite an MS67, so that is pretty good news. If you are able to cherry pick or find an entire roll of these 2005 Terry Fox Loonies, and they are all the no grass variety, you can probably make a pretty decent profit. I've seen these for sale at some of my local coin shops, and they are usually going for a pretty decent price. But regardless, it is one of the more rare and iconic Canadian loonies that you can look for whether you are searching through your pocket change or coin roll hunting and definitely a good one to have on your radar. In the year 2021, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the iconic Blue Nose ship, the Royal Canadian Mint introduced a redesign for the Canadian 10 cent coin featuring a new artistic rendition by Nova Scotia marine artist Eve Beroub. In a groundbreaking move, the Mint also released Canada's first ever colored dimes, incorporating a touch of blue to vividly portray the essence of the blue nose. The inspiration for this redesign actually traces back to the year 1937, when the blue nose ship, symbolizing a cherished national emblem for Canada, influenced the original design of the 10 cent coin during the reimagining of Canada's circulating coins. Marie LeMay, president and CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint, expressed enthusiasm about this historic occasion, emphasizing the enduring legacy of the Blue Nose in Canadian history. The Blue Nose was launched in March 1921 from Lunenburg Harbour and quickly gained fame as the swiftest fishing schooner worldwide. Not only did it secure a record catch on the Grand Banks in its inaugural season, but it also brought the International Fisherman's Trophy to Nova Scotia. The Blue Nose maintained an undefeated status in racing for almost two decades, earning the title Queen of the North Atlantic Fishing Fleet. Its international representation included notable appearances at events such as the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, and His Majesty King George V's Silver Jubilee in 1935. Contrary to its name, the Blue Nose actually had a black and red hull with a yellow strip. The term Blue Nose had been a moniker for Nova Scotians since at least the year 1785. The coin's reverse was designed by Yves Baroub and showcases an angled view of the Blue Nose under a full sail and heeled to port on an open sea. This dynamic portrayal is available in both colored and uncolored versions both of which bear the double-dated inscription 1921 to 2021. The colored version is groundbreaking for a 10-cent circulation coin, featuring blue highlights that represent the deep waters of the North Atlantic. The obverse side features the effigy of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Now, even though these commemorative design dimes from the year 2021 are incredibly revolutionary and beautiful, it is actually the single date plain design for the 2021 dime that you are looking for. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are actually four different designs for the 2021 dime. The first is the colored blue nose, then there is the uncolored commemorative blue nose design, then there is the double date. 
which will have the date of 1921 to 2021. And then there is the single date dime, which will only have the date of 2021. And that is the one that you want to look for. The mintage of a coin refers to the total number of copies produced, and it plays a crucial role in determining a coin's rarity and potential value in the collector's market. In the context of the four different designs for Canadian dimes in the year 2021, the regular design with a single date has a much lower mintage compared to the other three designs, making it more valuable and rare for several different reasons. Distribution and Circulation the regular design of a coin is often the one intended for general circulation, and these coins are distributed widely for everyday transactions. Usually special or commemorative designs will be produced in smaller quantities and may not be as widely circulated, but in the case of the single date 2021, it is actually the opposite. Collector interest. Collectors often show a keen interest in special or limited edition coin designs, leading to a higher demand for these coins. Usually the regular designs, being more common and part of everyday transactions, might not attract the same level of collector attention initially. But this is actually something that adds to the intrigue and allure of this single day 2021 as because it does not stand apart from any other Canadian dime in terms of its design, they can easily slip under the radar of normal coin muggles, I guess we will call them. Now, when I say coin muggle, I am not trying to say it in a derogatory sense, but basically it is a term that I will use for anyone that doesn't have any knowledge of numismatics, and they might actually let a coin that is worth a lot of money go in an everyday transaction. That's why it is always good to arm yourself with a little bit of knowledge. That way you don't accidentally let a coin into circulation that is worth hundreds or thousands of dollars by mistake. Minting decisions. Mintage decisions are made by the mint and they're based on factors such as public demand, commemorative events, and overall coin production requirements. Regular designs are typically minted in larger quantities to meet the demands of daily commerce, while special designs may have limited mintages. Now my best guess when it comes to the 2021 single date dime is that the Canadian Mint didn't actually have a really good plan in 2021 for how they were going to roll out the commemorative dimes. They may have actually struck some of the single date dimes at the beginning and then when they eventually planned or introduced the double date dimes with the date of 1921 to 2021, they may have actually switched up and produced a larger quantity of those. And because they had already made a decent amount of the single dates initially, they just released them into circulation and gave them out to banks. A similar situation would probably be with the 1991 quarters that have a very low mintage of around 450,000. Marketing and promotion. Special designs are often actively marketed and promoted by the mint, generating additional interest and demand. Regular designs may not receive the same level of promotional effort, which actually probably made the 2021 single date fly under the radar a little bit. Due to these factors and its lower mintage, coupled with the potential lower initial collector interest, can contribute to its rarity and consequently its increased value among collectors over time. However, the actual rarity and value will depend on the coin's condition and also the collector landscape for that particular year. Now, some of the details and specifications for the 2021 single date Canadian dime, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. It is composed of 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Susanna Blunt and Suzanne Taylor for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and has a die axis in metal alignment, which is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now, in terms of value, this is not a coin that you're going to get rich off of today. This is one that definitely has the potential to increase in value over time. And if you were to find one and it had any errors or anything special or notable about it, it may add to its value quite substantially. But it cannot be stated enough how rare these things are and how small your chances actually are of ever stumbling upon one of these in your pocket change. If you're a coin roll hunter, you might get lucky and find one of these every couple of boxes. But chances are you're going to have to search and search if you want to find one of these bad boys.
Now, in terms of value on the low end, it doesn't hold too much of a premium, but I would say you can probably get around a dollar for one of these, even if it's beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder. But the good news is it's a fairly recent dime, only two years old as I'm making this video. So chances are most of them are going to be in pretty good shape at this point still. But if you were able to find one and it scores at the high end of the Sheldon scale, so that is an MS67, you can get around $100 for this right now. Now, it is by far the most rare and valuable of all the different 2021 dimes that you can find. And I have no doubt that in 10 or 20 years, its value could easily increase tenfold. In the year 2012, there were three different Toonie designs released for circulation. The first is the original Toonie design with no added security features. The second are the security $2 coins. These Toonies were meticulously crafted at the Canadian Mint's cutting edge facility located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Leveraging the innovative multiply plated steel technology, these coins uphold the same manufacturing approach that has been successfully employed for Canada's lower denomination circulation coinage since the year 2001. This patented method involves the application of alternating layers of distinct metals including copper, nickel and brass onto a durable steel core. The result is a coin that not only utilizes fewer metals than traditional alloy coins, but also stands out for its cost effectiveness and circulation coin production. Beyond the efficiency of the multiply plated steel technology, the $2 circulation coins of the security series boast additional security features. These enhancements include new highly visible security elements designed to thwart counterfeiting attempts. The reverse side, also known as the tail side of the coin, showcases a laser mark micro engraving, contributing to the coin's advanced security measures. Furthermore, the $2 coins in the security series go above and beyond with the incorporation of a virtual image and edge lettering on the reverse side. This innovative addition enhances both the aesthetic appeal and the security profile of these coins, making them not only a functional medium of exchange, but also a testament to the Mint's commitment to staying at the forefront of coinage technology. The third and final 2012 $2 circulation coin that was released is a commemorative with a depiction of the HMS Shannon on the reverse. This coin holds a special significance as it commemorates the historic naval achievements of the HMS Shannon. Renowned for its notable victory in the capture of the USS Chesapeake during a pivotal naval battle in June 1813, this coin pays tribute to a key moment in maritime history. The Toonies reverse side encapsulates the essence of the HMS Shannon's remarkable feat, emphasizing its successful escort of the American War Prize into Halifax Harbor following the defeat of the USS Chesapeake. This engagement, which unfolded in June of 1813, marked a turning point in naval warfare and showcased the prowess of the HMS Shannon and her crew. Tragically, the battle resulted in the loss of 23 Shannon crewmen. The sacrifices made by these individuals are commemorated in the Royal Navy Burying Grounds and at the Old Burial Ground, both administered by St. Paul's Church in Halifax. The graves serve as poignant reminders of the human cost associated with the pursuit of victory and the defense of national interests. Notably, a tangible relic of the HMS Shannon's legacy is preserved in Halifax, the ship's bell. Displayed at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, the bell stands as a testament to the vessel's historical significance and the bravery of those who served aboard it. Now, even to find one of these regular HMS Shannon coins in your pocket change can be fun as this piece serves as a numismatic tribute to the naval prowess, sacrifices, and historical impact of this distinguished vessel. Now, little known to most, there is actually a rare variety that you can look for on this HMS Shannon Toonie that can add a premium to the coin, and it is often referred to as the extra sale variety. And to identify it, you should do the following. First, you want to examine the reverse side of the 2012 Canadian HMS Shannon $2 coin. Focus on the depiction of the HMS Shannon, particularly where the ship's sails are located. Now pay close attention to the sails on the right side of the ship, particularly the most closest to the right edge of the coin. In the case of the extra sail variety, there should be one additional sail to the right side compared to the other ship masts and sails. Now to confirm the presence of the extra sale variety, it's very helpful to compare a coin with a standard 2012 HMS Shannon Toonie. For a more detailed examination, consider using magnification such as a magnifying glass or a coin loop. 
This can help you scrutinize the finer details of the coin's design and confirm the presence of the additional sale. Numismatic communities and online forums often share images and information about coin varieties. You can check out some reputable sources or online forums where collectors discuss specific coin variations. If you guys are interested in joining my group on Facebook, Canadian Coin Roll Hunters, we actually have over 4,000 members now, and there are some members that post every single day. So if you think that you have found any of the coins that I discuss in any of these videos, and you would like to post a picture, you will definitely get some confirmation on whether you have the rare variety or the more common. If you ever are in doubt or if you want to ensure the accuracy of your identification, consider consulting numismatic experts or a reputable coin dealer. They may have the expertise to confirm the presence of the extra sale variety after physically inspecting the coin and possibly comparing it to high quality images. Now the overall mintage figures for the 2012 Toonies. The $2 2012 Toonie without any security features has a mintage figure of 1,531,000. The 2012 Toonie with security features has a mintage of 82,862,000. So it would seem that the original Toonie with no security features is a lot more rare in the year 2012, but it is not much more valuable than the other 2012 Toonies. The extra sale is the only one that is worth quite a bit more above face. Now the overall mintage for the 2012 HMS Shannon Toonie is 5 million, the extra sale variety being a very small limited number contained within that. In terms of its value, just to give you guys an idea in comparison, the regular HMS Shannon Toonie is only worth around $5 for an MS63 example. The most valuable of the 2012 toonies at an ms63 is the 2012 without any security features which is worth around 13 dollars now if you were to find one of the hms shannon toonies and you can identify the extra sale that can actually be worth 300 dollars for an ms63 example so this is a coin that will carry a premium even on the low end if it's not in great shape it can still probably be worth anywhere from five to ten dollars and as the condition increases as will the value now, if you were to find one of these and it scored an MS-65, it could be worth around $400. And if you got one and it scored an MS-67, you might even be talking a $700 to $1,000 toonie. But you definitely need to identify the extra sale or else it is not very valuable at all. Not worth much above face, even in a mint state. Now the Canadian Looney being released in the year 1987 is a fairly modern coin and unfortunately finding a Looney in your pocket change that will make you rich just isn't going to happen. But that doesn't mean that you can't keep your eyes out for one of these rare dollar coins and if you find one maybe today it isn't worth a fortune but some of these have the potential to increase in value as time goes on and they can definitely be worth more than face value especially if they're in really good condition. Now in the year 2012, there were actually four different designs released for Canadian loonies. The first is the regular loon design. The second is the loon design with added and improved security features. The production of the security $1 coins is carried out at the Mint's state-of-the-art facility located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. These coins are crafted utilizing the innovative multiply plated steel technology, a patented method that has been employed in the manufacturing of Canada's lower denomination circulation coinage since 2001. This technology also involves the application of alternating layers of distinct metals such as copper, nickel, and brass onto a steel core. This process significantly reduces the amount of metals required compared to traditional alloy coins, resulting in a cost-effective and environmentally conscious approach to coin production. These $1 coins also boost the incorporation of advanced security features contributing to the overall safeguarding of Canada's coinage system. Notably, the reverse side, also known as the tails, showcases a laser mark micro engraving. This addition enhances the visibility of security measures, providing an extra layer of protection against counterfeiting and bolstering the integrity of the currency. The third design released in 2012 is a circulation coin known as the Lucky Looney, with a distinctive purpose serving as a good luck charm for Canadian athletes participating in the prestigious 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games in London. This unique coin was crafted with the intention of bringing positive vibes and good fortune to the Canadian competitors on the global stage. The concept of the Lucky Looney has its roots in a captivating legend that emerged during the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City. According to the tale, a Looney, the iconic Canadian $1 coin featuring an image of a common loon 
was discreetly buried at the center of the ice rink just before the commencement of the games. This hidden coin was believed to carry a charm that would bestow good luck upon Canada's hockey teams. Remarkably, in the year 2002, both the men's and women hockey teams went on to secure gold medals, turning the lucky loony into a symbol of superstition and national pride. Now the fourth and final design for the Looney in 2012 is actually the one that you want to look for. It was released to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Grey Cup. This coin was issued as a tribute to the enduring legacy and significance of the Grey Cup, a symbol deeply ingrained in Canadian sports history. Struck with precision and artistry, the $1 coin features iconic imagery associated with the Grey Cup and its century-long tradition. The reverse side features a stylized depiction of the Grey Cup trophy and elements that capture the spirit of Canadian football. In addition to its artistic appeal, the coin serves as a tangible memento for Canadians to celebrate the rich heritage of Canadian football and the cultural significance of the Grey Cup. The issuance of this coin is not only a recognition of the sport's impact on Canadian identity, but also means of commemorating the athletes, teams, and fans who have contributed to the Grey Cup's storied legacy over the past hundred years. Now people will usually try and fish out the loonies or toonies with added security features as you would think that they would be worth more money, but that isn't really the case with these 2012 loonies. The value of both the Loon Reavers dollars from 2012 are both worth pretty much the same amount up and down the Sheldon scale, but little known to most, there is actually an error that you can look for on the Grey Cup commemorative that can add a premium to the coin. Now to identify this error, what you want to do is look at the date of 2012 and identify machine doubling. Here's a brief explanation of how machine doubling occurs. During the coin minting process, a blank metal disc, also called a planchette, is placed on the lower die, and the upper die descends to strike the planchette, transferring the design onto it. Machine doubling occurs when there is a slight movement or shift of the coin or the die during the striking process. The result is that parts of the design appear doubled, giving the illusion of additional details or thickness. However, unlike true doubled dies, machine doubling does not involve the doubling of the coin die itself. Instead, it is a secondary unintended impression caused by movement during the striking of the coin. Machine doubling can often create a flattened or shelf-like appearance to the doubled elements. Unlike genuine doubled dies, machine doubling is typically not as sharp or well-defined. It's also worth noting that machine doubling is a common occurrence and is usually considered a minor error in the minting process rather than a rare or sought after variety by coin collectors. But in the case of Canadian loonies, there are just so few that are actually worth any decent money that being able to identify even a minor error, especially if that date is known to contain one of these errors, can definitely add a premium to the coin. Now in terms of value, a regular 2012 Grey Cup loony isn't going to be worth much more than face value unless it is in impeccable condition, but it can be worth up to $100 if it does score an MS67, which is usually one of the highest grades obtained by Canadian coins. That being said, if you were able to identify doubling on the date of 2012, it could easily add a premium of anywhere from three to five times its original value depending on how bad somebody wants this coin. So around $300 would be my estimate if you found one of these with doubling and has scored an MS67. Usually PCGS does not attribute minor errors like this, but there is a chance if you send it off to ICCS, you may be able to get the extra error attribution and thus the coin should be worth more money if it's in a high grade state at least. Creating the new design for His Majesty King Charles III's effigy involved a comprehensive and multi-step process. Following the announcement by the Government of Canada, over 350 artists in a database and also mint engravers received email invitations. The artists and engravers that expressed interest provided a portfolio of portrait work for evaluation. A thorough assessment was then conducted for each of the respondents. The short list of artists and engravers were given an artist brief with mandatory design requirements. Design concepts underwent evaluation by an internal mint review panel assessing the submissions based on aesthetics, technical requirements, and their suitability for mass production. The winning design underwent scrutiny for necessary approvals from both the government and also Buckingham Palace. The mint initiated the engraving and tooling process involving the creation of dies essential for striking the new coins. 
Subsequently, the production or striking of the new circulation coins commenced. So it was announced by the Canadian Mint in late 2023 that King Charles III coins would start making an appearance in circulation. So apparently there are some 2023 dated King Charles III coins, but the era that we are discussing today is located on the 2024 King Charles III nickels. Now let's briefly discuss struck through or grease errors. Struck through grease errors happen when grease or other contaminants fill the recesses of a coin die, preventing it from fully impressing the design onto the coin. If grease accumulates in certain areas of the die, those areas may not strike the coin properly, resulting in missing details or a blurry appearance where the grease obstructs the design. The affected area on the coin will typically show missing or distorted features with a flattened or smeared appearance. Now there are several different types of struck through errors. Coins can be struck through wire, they can be struck through fabric. Coins that have struck through wire errors occur when a piece of wire or another foreign object is caught between the dies during the striking process. This foreign object interferes with the normal striking process, preventing the full impression of the design on the coin blank. The wire may also be partially embedded in the coin, leaving an impression on the struck surface. Usually these coins will exhibit a raised line or indentation corresponding to the shape of the wire or object. The affected area may have missing or distorted details depending on the severity of the interference. In both cases, these errors are considered minting anomalies and their occurrence is typically unintentional. They add an extra level of uniqueness and desirability to the affected coins and can be of great interest to collectors. The degree of rarity and also desirability of these errors depends on several factors such as the prominence of the struck through feature, the coin's overall condition, and the appeal to collectors seeking these unusual or error coins. Depending on the severity of the grease error, and also if the coin has a visible date, can greatly affect the value. But I know from experience that these are some of the most sought after error coins by experienced collectors. I've actually found a 2002 Canadian quarter with a pretty large grease error and I sold it for around $100 and it was honestly one of my most profitable coin roll hunting finds to date. In honor of Canada's 150th anniversary, a glow-in-the-dark coin was introduced into circulation, presenting the ethereal charm of the Northern Lights in a new, truly distinctive manner. Crafted for the special occasion of Canada's 150th birthday, the 2017 Toonie, aptly named the Dance of Spirits, pays homage to the marvels of Canadian landscapes by showcasing the breathtaking Aurora Borealis. The design on the reverse side of the Dance of the Spears 2017 Toonie portrays adventurers gracefully paddling across a tranquil lake beneath the radiant veil of the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are actually referred to as the Dance of the Spirits by the Cree peoples, adding cultural depth and symbolism to the coin. Another cohesive element among the different 2017 commemorative coins is the inclusion of the Canada 150th logo characterized by a mosaic arrangement of 13 triangular shapes, each representing a different province or territory. Some of the specifications for this coin, it was crafted with a three-ply nickel finish plated with steel for the outer ring and a three-ply brass finish plated with aluminum bronze for the inner core. The coin has a weight of 6.99 grams and a diameter of 28 millimeters and was released for general circulation. Marking a significant milestone in coinage history, the Canadian 2017 Glow in the Dark Toonie stands out as the world's premier glow in the dark coin to be introduced into general circulation. This wasn't the first instance of the Canadian Mint venturing into the realm of glow-in-the-dark coins. In the year 2012, Canada unveiled a quarter featuring the luminous skeleton of a dinosaur. Though this coin wasn't intended for widespread circulation, its innovation didn't go unnoticed. In fact, it garnered the prestigious Krauss Publications 2014 Coin of the Year Award for its trailblazing design, further solidifying Canada's reputation as a leader in numismatic innovation. Now, what do you say we get into the coin that you guys are all here to find out about, and that is the Canadian 2017 Snow on Trees variety for this Glow in the Dark Toonie. Now, the 2017 Glow in the Dark Snow on Trees variety presents a distinctive feature that sets it apart from its regular counterpart. To identify this unique variety, one must scrutinize the details of the tree line on the center brass core of the coin. 
If the tree line is outlined by a white shading or glow, then it belongs to the snow on trees variety. If there is no white outlining the trees, then it is the standard version without any variety. While this error or variety might not be widely recognized currently, it bears similarities to popular errors seen in coins from the United States, which have garnered considerable attention among collectors. Considering the rarity of the 2017 Toonie, which is arguably one of the most scarcest in circulation, with a minimum base value ranging from $10 to $20 when they sell online, possessing the snow on trees or the snow on mountains variety could elevate the value of a high grade example to being one of the most coveted among Toonie collectors. Now, if we take a look at coin errors in the United States, one notable example is the extra leaf error found on the Wisconsin State Quarter, which was released in the year 2004 as part of the 50 State Quarters program. Now, on this subtle error, an additional leaf appears on the ear of the corn featured on the reverse side of the coin. This anomaly was the result of a dye variety, likely due to misalignment during the minting process. Coin errors like the extra leaf Wisconsin quarter can significantly impact the value of a coin. Collectors often seek out such varieties due to their rarity and uniqueness. In the case of the Wisconsin quarter, coins with the extra leaf error can fetch prices well above their face value, particularly if they're in high grade condition. Depending on factors such as the severity of the error, the coin's condition, and also demand from collectors, the value of these error coins can vary widely. These varieties are often viewed as curiosities and highly sought after by numismatists. As a result, air coins can command premiums in the numismatic market, and it makes them a valuable asset for collectors who are keen to acquire rare and unusual pieces that may appreciate in value. So even though this 2017 Toonie might not be setting the coin world on fire right now, it doesn't mean that that can't change very quickly, and this could easily become one of the most valuable Toonies that you could find or look for. If I had to give an estimate currently, if you were able to find one of these and identify the snow on trees variety, it would probably be worth about 5 to 10 times the value of the regular glow in the dark toonie. So the regular glow in the dark being worth around $100 to $150 in a high grade state, I don't doubt that this coin could be worth up to $1000 if it scored in the high mint state range and somebody really wanted to add it to their collection. Now one super crucial piece of advice that I want to share is about the value of coins. One of the questions that I get asked most often on my channel is how much is my coin worth? Now whether it's a rare gem, a key date, an error or variety, or even a common piece, determining a coin's true worth boils down to a simple fact. It's worth exactly what someone is willing to pay for it. Even though I might assess a coin at a certain value based on several factors such as rarity and condition, that estimate doesn't necessarily guarantee that the coin will actually sell for that price. For instance, you might find a buyer willing to pay top dollar for an MS67 example of a coin, especially if they're a passionate collector of air coins. But in most cases, buying and selling coins often results in a loss rather than a substantial profit. Now there are instances where seemingly ordinary coins can fetch far more than their face value. I've actually experienced this firsthand. Some individuals have disposable income and are willing to splurge on coins, while others are driven by the desire to complete their collections and are willing to pay a premium for specific pieces. Additionally, there are those who may not be well versed in coin valuation and are simply drawn to spending money on items they find intriguing. So to summarize, a coin's rarity and potential value doesn't always translate into a guaranteed sale. Sometimes seemingly insignificant coins can sometimes fetch unexpectedly high prices. While I do advocate for honesty in representing a coin's value and discourage misrepresentation for profit, I also believe that certain modern coins, such as colored Canadian quarters from certain years, hold value beyond their face value. These coins, although occasionally encountered in everyday transactions in Canada, can be highly sought after by collectors worldwide, leading to increased demand and higher prices. So all of that being said, if you did find one of these 2017 toonies and you are able to identify the snow on trees variety your best chance of being able to sell one of these for the highest premium is probably going to be on ebay or an online marketplace site like maybe facebook marketplace or kijiji the 2000p canadian dime now this dime features the exquisite depiction of the iconic blue nose schooner on its reverse side. The blue nose is a symbol of Canadian maritime history celebrated for its elegance and also its speed. 
The Blue Nose design was first introduced in the year 1937 and is still featured on the reverse of the 10 cent coins produced in Canada today. The Blue Nose design has become synonymous with Canadian identity and is beloved by collectors and Canadians alike. Its timeless beauty and significance make it a fitting tribute to the country's rich maritime heritage. Now the reason that this particular dime holds such a special place in Canadian numismatic history as it was one of the first dimes the Royal Canadian Mint used the P Mint mark to denote production at the new facility in Winnipeg and also the composition change of Canadian coins. The introduction of the P Mint mark or composition mark on the 2000P Canadian dime marked a significant milestone for the Royal Canadian Mint. It not only signified the growing role of the facility in Winnipeg, but also highlighted the shift in composition of Canadian coins. The new composition change for the Canadian coins involved transitioning from a primarily nickel-based alloy to a multiply plated steel core. This change was implemented to improve durability and reduce production costs. The inclusion of this P mint mark on the 2000 P Canadian dimes serves as a visual representation of these advancements in both production and composition. Now you might be wondering, what is the big deal? What is it that makes this coin so valuable? Well, it's not just about the value, but it's also about the excitement of the hunt and also the incredible stories they carry that make these coins incredibly special. But here's where it gets interesting. The 2000p dimes aren't your ordinary coins. They were part of a fascinating experiment at the Canadian Mint. While the Canadian 2000p nickels were released for circulation with a limited mintage of just under 5 million, the dimes and quarters with P mint marks or composition marks didn't make their debut officially for circulation until the year 2001. There was a test set issued by the mint in the year 1999 containing coins with the date 1999 and also P mint marks, however no such set was released in the year 2000, so any 2000 P dimes or quarters that you come across with that P mint mark were either released by mistake or found their way into circulation through vending machine companies testing the new coins. The way that you can identify this 2000 P dime is to look for the P mint mark under the bust of Queen Elizabeth II on the obverse of the coin. The presence of this P mint mark on the 2000 dated Canadian dime adds to its rarity and collectability. It is only believed that a limited number of the 2000 P dimes were ever produced and is unknown exactly how many of these made their way into the wilds of circulation but it is estimated that no more than 250 of these holy grail coins were ever produced. Now this P mint mark indicates that the coin is made of multiply plated steel which replaced the nickel and other compositions used before the year 2000. Now I'm sure you are all wondering about the value of this coin. Unlike the 1969 large date dime which I have covered in a previous video, these 2000 P dimes are considered heirs, however their scarcity and unique history make them a prized find for collectors. While these coins might not make you an instant millionaire, they can fetch you some pretty good money, especially if you were to find one of them in your pocket change. They are a true testament to Canada's ever-evolving coinage journey. So the next time you come across a 2000p Canadian dime in your change collection or coin roll hunting, remember, it's not just a coin, it is also a piece of history. Now that we have discussed the story and how to identify this extremely rare coin, what do you say we get into some of the specifications and potential value if you were ever to discover one of these gems floating around in your pocket change or in one of your coin roll hunts? Some of the details and specifications for the Canadian 2000p 10 cent coin. It is composed of multiply plated steel, which is 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and coated with 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The artists who designed and engraved the coin, the obverse was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran, and the reverse was engraved and designed by Emmanuel Hahn. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis in metal alignment. So if you ever discover any of these, you definitely want to make sure that all of those specifications check out. You want to make sure the edge is readed, it is magnetic, and has the correct weight and also thickness and diameter. Now, if you do identify all of those factors in terms of value, 
Coins in Canada does not actually list low-end values, but I will give you guys the North Central Coins estimate. If you were able to find a 2,000p Canadian dime and it scores at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale, so that is around an AG3, I estimate you can probably get anywhere from $25 to $50 for it. Somebody will probably want it to fill out their collection, and even if you took it down to your local coin shop, they will probably pay a little bit of money for it. You might be able to get around $100 for a fine and up to $300 for an AU50. Now, when you start getting into the MS territory, you see some pretty big jumps in terms of value for this coin. It can be worth around $588 for an MS60. It can be worth around $931 for an MS64. And this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $2,410 for an MS67 example. Now, just to give you an idea in terms of value, the 2000 Canadian dime without a P mint mark is only worth around $0.25 cents for an MS60. And the maximum value that you could get for one of these is around 50 to maybe $75 if it scored an MS66 or MS67. So the 2000P is far rarer than the 2000 Canadian dime without the P mint mark. And you can definitely make some good money off of one of these if you were able to score one. Some of the great things about a lot of the coins that I am mentioning in these videos is that it is unknown exactly how many of them were released for circulation. So you never actually know if you might have one hiding in your change jar right now. What do you guys think about the Canadian 2000p dime? What would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins mentioned in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. Also, don't forget to smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also hit that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content as it is being released. But I think that is pretty much going to do it for this one, guys. I really appreciate you guys watching and joining me for all of these incredible coin adventures. But until the next one, everybody, peace out and have a good one, y'all.